Does everyone have a copy of tonight's worksheet? This is lesson number 27. The, the title is The Sign and the Seal. And uh, we're going to open our Bibles to Romans chapter 4 and start there. This is kind of uh, an aside. I'm not necessarily going to talk about exactly what Paul talks about or only what Paul talks about. But in our world today, there's a, a big question about uh, what is called infant baptism versus what is called believer's baptism. Credo baptism versus pedo baptism. And uh, a lot of people will say, well, you know, Baptists believe in adult baptism and, and you know, Presbyterians and Protestants all believe in child baptism. But that's not true. That muddies the issue. The reality is that we uh, also believe in child baptism if a child believes the gospel and is a Christian. And so I was baptized as a child. Uh, most of my, all of my children were baptized as children, but it was after their profession of faith. And one of the proof texts for, or, you know, one of the great ideas for infant baptism is the sign of circumcision and how that tracks from Old Testament to New Testament. And there's a case to be made for it, but I think it's the wrong case. Okay, so the people who make the case, they're not insane. They have reasons for believing what they believe, but they're wrong. And so I don't mind uh, pointing that out because uh, I think that the, the weight of the scripture is behind believers baptism. So I'll throw that out at the outset. That's kind of where we're going to go from this verse, though we are going to look at what Paul has to say. As we read, let's remember this. Your first bullet point is this. Paul is pointing us back to something God did in the past to teach us about God's workings in the present. And I want to help you with something. Whenever you're talking with someone and you bring up a scripture verse and you say, well, this is the heart of God about this, that, and the other. If the knee-jerk reaction from the person you're talking to is, well, that's the Old Testament, so it doesn't really apply. I think that they have some serious issues in understanding who God is and how he works. On the flip side of that, there's, there's another ditch on the other side that is we read the New Testament like it's the Old Testament and read the Old Testament like it's the New Testament. So it's wrong to just say, well, everything in the Old Testament, that was for other people at a different time. But it's equally wrong to say, well, everything in the Old Testament is equally valid for us as the stuff in the New Testament. Both of those things are ditches on the wrong side of that which is right and true. Um, here's what Paul does. Here's your next bullet point. Does Paul say, well, circumcision was the Old Testament. So there's no new covenant reality or new covenant understanding for us. The answer is no, he doesn't. In fact, it's quite the opposite of how Paul approaches it. Now, Paul recognizes that something like circumcision is no longer necessary for someone to be in the New Testament covenant. But he also recognizes that there are things that track through. As Paul's dealing with people who look to their circumcision and their law keeping for righteousness, it would have been very easy for him to say, if it were true, it would have been very easy for him to say, listen, God pushed the reset button. All that stuff's gone. All that stuff's done. We're doing a new thing now. But that's not what Paul does. Because the truth is, is that God is very much operating now as he operated then. He's receiving people who come to him by faith. He puts people into the covenant by faith. And so there are things that track all the way through. But there's also been a lot of changes that were made. He doesn't say, oh, you know, this thing of circumcision was abolished. Instead, he's saying, basically, you're framing it wrong. Circumcision was good and it was right for Abraham, but it was not the thing that saved him. 
right? Circumcision was something that he did because he was saved. That's the point. Uh, Paul's framing it that way. Here's your next bullet point. There are unique differences between the old and the new covenants, but it's the same God, the same lawgiver, and the same Savior. Jesus did not come to abolish any of the old covenant, any of the law. He came to fulfill it. And so our relationship to the Old Testament should be more like this. We should say, all of the old covenant and all of the new covenant was fulfilled by Christ. So how should we relate to a fulfilled covenant? How should we as believers in Christ relate to the God who has fulfilled the law and the prophets? How are we to relate to the fulfilled word of God as the new covenant people of God? And I think that's a much better question. I think that's closer to the apostolic framing of the issue. So let's read our text. We'll just take one verse. Speaking of Abraham, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 4 verse 11, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Father, bless us now and cause us to see. Give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear. Uh, we recognize that this does not just happen. And so we request it humbly. As people who believe in you, as people who trust in you, we look to you and say, Father, open our eyes. Give us grace to know you, to hear your word, to see your work in our lives. And we will rejoice. And we rejoice now with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's your next bullet point. This passage... Romans 4, verse 11, ought to inform our thinking regarding the sign and the seal of the new covenant, which we believe is no longer physical circumcision, but that representation of the putting off of the filth of the flesh in the act of baptism. And so we recognize that the, the old covenant picture of the putting off of the filth of the flesh was circumcision, the cutting off of the flesh. In the New Testament, we have a similar sign, and it is a water baptism. And now it's problematic to assume, as a lot of people do, that there is an exact correlation between the sign and the seal of the Old Covenant and the sign and the seal of the New that there's an exact correlation one-to-one -one, between circumcision and baptism. There is not an exact one-to-one -one correlation. Um, I'll say more on that later. But here's your next bullet point. Many, and I put in parentheses, actually most, if not all, of our Protestant brethren, due to the thinking of replacement theology, see infant baptism as the sign and seal. And, and it, this is how the thinking goes. The sign was given to infants in the Old Testament. Did the children have to believe before they were circumcised? And the answer is, of course not. They were circumcised in the eighth day of their life. You don't believe anything then, right? Nobody's doing much believing uh, out of the stuff that you're doing. Believing is not one of the things. And so the idea is, well, if that's how things went then, why should the sign and the seal of the covenant be different today? In fact, I've quoted both Calvin and Luther several times in my study of Romans because they've been very helpful to me in my thinking and my understanding when it comes to justification by faith. Those guys got it. I mean, they got it. They were sharp. The things that they have to say were very helpful. But they were really stubborn, really bullheaded in some things. Aren't you glad you're not like that, you know? But they, they were pretty stubborn when it came to infant baptism. And that was just one thing that uh, in their own minds they, they couldn't get. And infant baptism or pedo baptism is one of those places that makes me scratch my head. 
And uh, I've been doing some reading on it over the past week and learning a lot. And I think uh, there are a lot of arguments from history, a lot of arguments from Scripture, a lot of arguments from uh, historical record that infant baptism was not the practice of the early church. It was not the practice of the early church fathers. At least for 150 years after Christ, there's really no mention of it. And so it's just, it's one of those things. But the reality is, um, they have and we have the same scriptures, right? We have the same verses that we look at, but we have very different glasses that we put on when we read the scripture. We, we frame the arguments very different ways. Richard um, Jewell has been really, or Paul King Jewett, I'm sorry, Paul King Jewett has been really helpful to me. And in one of his books, he has this, it's actually one of the first uh, paragraphs in his book, I've given it to you. The subject of infant baptism is one about which it is easier to write voluminously than significantly. And that's true. So <laughs> I thought you might enjoy that. But here's what he says. In the Institutes of the Christian Religion, John Calvin allotted 20 pages to the discussion of baptism in, gen in general, followed by 38 pages defending infant baptism in particular as, quote, perfectly consistent with the institution of Christ and the nature of the sign, end quote. How often his example has been imitated. As a result, the centuries have been flooded with books and the world with words on both sides of the question. Just to read this literature is a great chore, and much of it deserves to molder in oblivion. Yet theologians of the first rank have wrestled with the problem, and if their thoughts are not always edifying, they are nonetheless worthy of consideration. And so it's just interesting how much there is uh, written on this. Just to give you an idea, look at the title of the book. Infant baptism in the covenant of grace and appraisal of the argument that as infants were once circumcised, so they should now be baptized. That's the title. So if that gives you any idea about the kind of nerdy books that are written on this thing voluminously. Uh, but anyways, uh, I hope and pray that my message tonight does not deserve to molder in oblivion with all of those words. My prayer is that this message would edify us and that it would really be helpful. So that's my prayer. Here's your next bullet point. Circumcision is the sign God gave to Abraham. It was a signal of his faith. We say sign, the idea is signal, but it was still given to all of his physical children on the eighth day of their life outside the womb according to the will of God. If you want to flip over to Genesis 17, uh, just for sake of space, I didn't put a lot of these verses in your notes, so we can flip over there. But uh, No one... Uh, who was part of the family, born into the family covenant of Israel, practiced believer's circumcision. Abraham practiced believer's circumcision after he believed, right? And others who came from other nations and other uh, peoples who came to Israel, they would practice it. But if your children were born in your household, in a believing Jewish household, they would be circumcised as infants. Here's what the scripture says, Genesis 17, verses 1 through 14. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful. I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, and their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. This is my covenant. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. 
And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man, child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. So this particular act was a lifelong token of belonging to the God of Abraham. And it was performed on all the males. Also, it's given to, to all who claim to trust in the covenant-making God of Israel. So for example, you're a Philistine. And you say, I don't want to worship the gods of the Philistines anymore. I want to move into Israel and worship Jehovah. Okay, you have to take the signal that you are a true believer. And that signal would be the act of circumcision. So if someone comes along and says, listen, I, I, don't, I don't want to, to receive this sign. Well, you, you don't, obviously you don't belong here. And so you'll be cut off from the covenant. You'll be cut off from the familial portion of the covenant. So here's your next bullet point. Anyone who refused this token or signal of the covenant God made with his people would be cast out and told that they had no part with the people of God. So God made a covenant, but obviously this person wants nothing to do with it. So they have to be cast out. And, and the interesting thing is about this covenant, one of the ways that it differs from baptism is that it pointed to the reality of a coming Messiah. That is God born of human flesh. And so this idea was that through Abraham's line, and we'll see it in our lesson next week, getting into verses 12 through 17, that this line that God has made through Abraham is going to produce or sire the Messiah. Here's your bullet point. God gave this sign as a seal to be done once for each person person, it should say each male person, as they entered into the familial covenant. And one of the ways that this doesn't track is that uh, obviously in the New Testament, women are baptized. We find women, when they trust Christ, they're baptized. And so right off the bat, it's easy to say, well, there can't be a one-to-one -one similarity from circumcision right into baptism. But it was of perpetual validity. Now God gave them also a meal. So there's a sign and a seal, but there's also a meal. That's the Passover. And in the New Testament church, we have a signal of our faith that is done once at our conversion, and that is baptism. And then we have a meal that we partake of on a regular basis to remember not our exodus from Egypt, but the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, his broken body and his shed blood. And circumcision was a token it was different from the Passover, but it was a token of the fact that God had called them to himself to make them a peculiar people, his own particular people. It was a signal that they belonged to him. Now, here's your next bullet point. The church has a similar token that does not contribute to salvation in any way. Much like circumcision is a signal of the cutting off of the flesh. Um, and being a part of God's covenant people, baptism is a signal of Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection. It does not contribute to our salvation. Rather, it is an outward signal of something that we have come to believe in our hearts. Now, what made this change? Well, here's your bullet point. This change came about through Christ's fulfillment of the law. After Christ came, there is no more coming Messiah. The, the line of Abraham is no longer necessary to produce a Messiah. We don't need another baby born and laid in a manger. We don't need another uh, virgin's womb to bring forth a child. That's happened. It's done. That signal is also done. And so now there is a new signal. And Jesus gives it to us. It's in your notes, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. 
Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, what's the next word? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And Matthew tacks on the end, as far as we can tell, is Matthew. He says, Amen. And we say Amen as well. So, why don't all believing parents baptize their sons and their daughters? Ought we to do that? Aren't we to expect, are we to expect that to carry over from the old covenant tradition into the new covenant church? Most people say yes. This is something that makes Baptists unique. In fact, it's one of the things that makes them uh, despised generally. One of the first things that Baptist people were called was Anabaptist, which word means rebaptizers. And Baptists said, we're not rebaptizers. We don't think the first baptism was legitimate. And so it created problems created problems in America, and it still could, it still very possibly could. Whereas if I were to go to a Presbyterian church and join the Presbyterian church, and they say, have you been saved? Have you been baptized? I say, yes, I've been saved. Yes, I've been baptized. They would say, well, come and join us at the Lord's table. They would accept my baptism. But if a Presbyterian came here and I said, have you been saved? Yes, I was saved. Have you been baptized by immersion since you were saved? And they say, well, I was baptized as an infant. I was born, I was baptized, and I grew up in a Christian home. I came to faith when I was nine years old, and, and I'm a Christian. We would not accept his baptism. We would say, well, sir, you need to be baptized as a token of your faith. And I know a lot of people find that hard. They find that hard. It's like beyond the pale. And maybe I'm wrong for this, but we see it in the Scripture. We see this as the pattern and the teaching of the New Testament rather clearly. All right, so here's what we have. Uh, the big point. Why do Baptists practice believers' baptism? Well, here's your first point. Number one, and, and most importantly... Jesus gave us the message to baptize those who believe. So that's what Jesus told us to do. Baptize the ones who believe. Look at Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. So Jesus taught that people must first believe and then be baptized. And this is very important. It's your next bullet point. Jesus does not make baptism a requirement for salvation. He says, he that believeth not shall be damned. It does not, he who is not baptized shall be damned. He who believeth not shall be damned. Baptism is not a requirement for salvation. He makes salvation a requirement for baptism, he that believeth and is baptized. Number two, believer's baptism was the apostolic message. In Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches to a crowd of believing and circumcised Jews. But they were not yet believing in Jesus. They were believing in the, the truths of the old covenant, but they didn't know the truth of a uh, of a crucified, buried, resurrected, and ascended Savior at the right hand of the Father. They had not heard about Jesus Christ, the Messiah. They had been circumcised. They were trusting in, uh, to the best of their ability, what they knew, but they were not yet believing in Jesus. So Peter preaches the gospel, and those who were present are convicted of their sin. And look at the note here, Acts 2, 37 and 38. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for 
the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, we understand the for there means because of. So repent, and with repentance comes the remission of sins. So repent, and they then be baptized because of the remission of sins. And look at what uh, a paedo-baptist who would read this. They, uh, let me put it this way. A paedo-baptist who still believes in justification by faith alone, who looks at baptism as the old covenant believers would have looked at circumcision. That is, it does not save you. It makes you part of the visible covenantal family. That is, it puts you in the church, but it doesn't get you to heaven. You have to come to believe in Christ in order to go to heaven. Um, They would make the argument that this is how any missionary to a pagan land would operate. So if I go to a pagan land and a Presbyterian goes to a pagan land, the first generation is going to look the same. We're all going to preach, repent, and then be baptized. Trust Christ and then be baptized. It's the second generation where it would change because they would say, be baptized and have your children baptized in order to be a part of the covenant community in the church. But this is not the apostolic message. And here's the thing. I cannot make the argument that no children were baptized in the early church. Because I would be arguing from a place of silence. The scripture never says no children were baptized, right? No children were baptized in the making of this covenant, right? It doesn't say that. But the silence is different almost deafening over the fact that we're never given any instruction to. Here's your bullet point. Peter does not say repent, be baptized, and baptize your children. He doesn't say that. In fact, we could make the argument, well, here he is in Jerusalem, and and in Jerusalem, they would have known You receive the sign, then you go home and you give it to your kids. Okay, make that argument. But then what about when they were in pagan lands? Did they ever teach that? Did they ever educate someone to give this sign of baptism to their children? Was it ever something that was done? There's one really big proof text that I will bring out in just a little bit from Acts 16. But you can look at every place where baptism was administered in the book of Acts And in all of the epistles, you can look at every place where baptism was administered. It is always specifically believing adults. And there is never any clear statement that it was infants or that the apostles even hinted that it should have been. And you would think if it was such a big deal, something would have been said about it. You would just assume. But this brings us to our third point. Number three, believers baptism was the apostolic pattern. That is, it best fits the New Testament narrative. So let's consider this text now. Go to Acts chapter 8. And I really do have to, to hurry here. Um, circumcision was administered upon the young men of the family to prove the faith that the fathers possessed. But in the New Testament, baptism is Always, um, and is, this is your, is your bullet point, baptism is always performed in the New Testament as a person's public confession of their faith in Christ and the righteousness they have received from him. And I did capital A, capital L, capital W, capital A, capital Y, capital S, because you can't find it any, any other way. It is always a person's public confession of their faith. Look at what the scripture records in Acts 8, verses 34 through 39. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I 
I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized them. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. It's always a public confession. Can I be baptized? If you believe, you may. If you believe, you may. Right? It's not, does your father believe? Does the head of your household believe? The covenant is not a familial covenant. And we'll deal with that in just a moment. But do you believe? If you believe, you may. Go to Acts 16. Well, actually, I think I gave all these in your notes. You don't have to. Um, Acts 16 is another favorite uh, proof text for Pado baptists And there are men that I know and I love and I respect who differ with me on this issue. They're my friends. I would sit with them and break bread and fellowship and laugh and enjoy time with them. I'd read their books. I've read some of them. I'd be blessed by them. But they couldn't join my church <laughs> unless they were baptized by immersion after their profession of faith. And uh, it's just the way that it is. And, and I might, I'd listen to them speak, might even let them speak. Um, I have no intention of being cruel or calling names. I respect their intelligence. Some of these guys are much, much smarter than I am. But uh, I have a particular set of glasses with which I see clarity in the scriptures. And we've outlined our position on believers' baptism as a church and, and we wouldn't let anyone join without submitting to the rule of the church. But as far as the ones I've personally engaged with, this is always the favorite proof text. Acts chapter 16, in your notes, verses 30 through 33. This is after um, Paul and Silas were preaching and they sang and prayed at midnight. And the doors opened up through an earthquake in the prison. And the jailer brings them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And here's how, this, here's how the line of thinking goes. Don't you see? He was baptized and all of his house. He believed and he was saved with all of his house. And he was baptized with all of his house. There had to be children there. Could you imagine that there aren't little infant babies there? Could you imagine a home without any little babies in it? Well, I can. <laughs> Have you ever been in a home where no babies are living? But we're supposed to be shocked. Oh, a, a family without any little infants in it? I mean, it's very possible, right? It's very possible. But the line of thinking is, well, obviously, it's just like the old covenant sign of circumcision. The head of house believes and he's baptized. And so everyone's given the sign and seal of baptism. But first off, we should deal with the logic issue that's glaring us in the face. Under the old covenant, the whole household was never circumcised. Just the males. Right? It was never the whole household. It was only the men. Here's your next bullet point. Uh, if everything tracks one to one from the old covenant sign to the new covenant sign, here's a good question. Why do Pado baptists baptize their daughters? Shouldn't it just be their sons? Shouldn't it just be the males? Shouldn't it just be the, the head of the household? Baptism would be for the sons and for the men. And that's how it worked in the old covenant. But the reality is, and it's kind of good I didn't have you turn there because some of you had to tip my hand already. But Acts chapter 16, 30 through 33, give this argument. And this is where the argument ends because the very next verse just destroys it. Look at what Acts 16, 34 says in your notes. And when he had brought them, this is Paul and Silas, into his house, he sat meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. The point is plain. All the house believed. 
and all the house was baptized. Here's your next bullet point. The point of Acts 16 is that every person who was baptized in the jailer's house received the sign of baptism after they received the righteousness that comes by believing the gospel. This is a terrible proof text for infant baptism. This is a great picture of believer's baptism. And in a very large sense, this is what Paul's arguing for in Romans chapter 4, verse 11. Abraham practiced believer's circumcision. It was given to him before, uh, or I'm sorry, rather after he believed, not before. Okay, number four, our fourth point is that Paul is arguing from the fact that the New Testament covenant is not a familial covenant. Um, and this is a huge reason. A person can be a covenantalist or believe in covenant theology and not be a pedo baptist Those people exist. I mean, I've met some. They're like the, you know, the liger or, you know, I don't know, the zebra mule that's like super rare, but they exist. They're out there and they believe in believer's baptism. And uh, in most every other way, they're Protestant which is kind of interesting. But the New Testament church is not a family line. Abraham was. And the sign was administered to all of the males born in the household. But the New Covenant church is not a family line. Um, God's church has not been built from a particular family in the earth. It's been built from saints who have been called out of every tribe and every tongue and every kindred and every people group. Here's your bullet point. God's covenant now is with his church. And baptism is a local church ordinance. It's something he has ordered his church to do. I have no authority in my home to baptize my sons or my daughters. It's something that a church does. It's something that a covenanted group of people in a local church will perform. Uh, it's the church that has the authority to preach the word, to make disciples, to baptize those who believe. That is the job of the New Testament church. That is the covenant people of God. Now, I've given you in your notes, it's the first time I've ever put a meme into your notes, but I've given you a meme from a Presbyterian who shows, I'll read it to you because it's a little tough to see. The top picture is God's covenant, let me read it, God's visible people before Christ. And then in the picture below, it's God's visible people after Christ. And he just scribbled out the face of the baby. And so that's the line of thinking. Oh, could you believe? They would say their children aren't part of Christ's visible community. The reality is, is that in the Old Covenant, God's visible people consisted of husbands and wives and their children, and they lived, as they lived, in happiness and worship, waiting for the Messiah to come. Now, following this line of thinking, and this is sort of the Protestant line of pedo baptism God's people today are also living, husbands and wives and their children, in community, waiting for the coming of Messiah. It is a beautiful picture. There might be some practical benefits that come from that line of thinking, but since it's flawed, it could ultimately be harmful. So what does the apostle say in our text? Here's your next point. Abraham received the sign of circumcision that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised. In other words, righteousness is imputed even to Gentiles and they become heirs to the promise of eternal life and the eternal kingdom. Here's your next bullet point. We enter into the visible community of saints, not by the sign of circumcision, but by the sign of baptism. And it occurs after we believe the gospel. In other words, you are not a member of a church, at least this church, until you profess Christ. I don't want to give a little child the idea that they are a part of Christ's church without faith. Would you want to give that impression? 
Now be a little good little Christian now. You are a part of God's flock. You're a part of God's family. You're a part of God's church. Why? Because we baptized you when you were very tiny. That is not healthy. It's not wise. And it certainly isn't good. Um, there were promises made to the family of Abraham that have zero application to believers today. But there were promises made to those who are the children of Abraham by faith in Jehovah God. And Paul's argument kind of hinges on the fact that Abraham was declared righteous before he received the sign. So, bottom line, we should all agree on this. Here's your bullet point. The sign, whether circumcision in the Old Covenant or baptism in the New, the sign has no saving power at all. It signifies a spiritual reality. The seal that Paul talks about, is it's the word for a signet ring. It's a marking. You could put an impression on a wax seal, and you could seal a thing and say, this is mine. It, it, the, it has the authority of the person making the seal. And circumcision was an actual impression. It was a cutting. It was a mark on the flesh that stood forever. But it was, it was really only a signal of a spiritual reality. We are the people of God. For the New Testament church, I think it ought to be very plain. How does one become a part of God's church? God's people. God's family. It's very simply this. By faith. And when a person believes, they're baptized. There's all sorts of issues for people who are pedo baptists And you could ask them. Uh, if you ever meet someone who believes in infant baptism, ask them if they practice infant community or communion. Do the infants take communion at your church? Do they drink the wine? Do they eat the bread? No. Well, why not? Well, they haven't had their confirmation. They haven't really become part of the church. Oh. Do they vote? Are they allowed to vote in the things? Are they really a part of the visible body of Christ? It's always no. Not always. There's a few who try to be consistent, but it makes problems of their own. But the reality is, uh, God has no grandchildren. Um, Christ is the head of the church. We come to him by faith, and the signal of that after we believe is baptism. Now, here's your next bullet point. As Gentiles, we still look to Abraham, not as our patriarch, but as our father in faith. We hope and we pray and we work for our sons and daughters all to come to that faith as well. And Jesus spoke to us about the kingdom, about the new birth. He taught us that we must come to him by faith. He's given us the gospel and an understanding of what it is that makes us new creations in him. And... He's given us the sign of baptism, a signal that does not make us righteous, but it reveals it is a symbol, a signal of a spiritual reality. Um, now, perhaps you've noticed something as I go through these. I have not argued from history. Although I could, there are arguments to be made from history. I have not argued from a strict logic, although we have a form of dispensational thinking that requires some logical thought. I have tried to keep my argument strictly to what does the Bible say? And when we come at it from the question, what does the Bible explicitly say? We find that it gives us great leave to practice believers' baptism. Preach the gospel, baptize those who believe. And no reason to practice infant baptism. I'll leave you with a quote from Spurgeon. He says this, quote, If I thought it wrong to be a Baptist, I should give it up and become what I believe to be right. If we could find infant baptism in the Word of God, we would adopt it. It would help us out of a great difficulty. For it would take away from us that reproach which is attached to us. That we are odd and do not as other people do. But we have looked well through the Bible. And cannot find it. And do not believe it is there. Nor do we believe that others can find infant baptism in the scriptures. Unless they themselves first put it there. End quote. Let's pray together.
Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the scripture. And we thank you for this little detour just to explore why we believe in believer's baptism, why we practice believer's baptism. Lord, we ask that you would give us more folks who believe. We pray that the waters of baptism would be stirred as an evidence of you working among us. Lord, draw people to yourself. Give us courage and boldness to preach the word. And I ask that you would help us to make a difference. Bless us as we go. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.